Joanna Cherry. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I'm, I'm very pleased to follow the Honourable Member for Devizes. We, there's many things about which we disagree, but there are some things about which we agree, and I thank him for his kind comments. Can I also congratulate the Right Honourable Member for Basingstoke in securing this debate, and uh, congratulate the many Honourable Members who have made interesting and valuable contributions, particularly my Honourable Friend, the Member for Motherwell and Wishaw, who was such a doughty campaigner for disability rights and particularly the rights of disabled women. Madam Deputy Speaker, during this International Women's Day debate, it is the women of Ukraine who should be uppermost in our minds. This morning, I and other female MPs, a cross-party group, met with the Ukrainian ambassador's wife and speaking with her impressed upon me the terrible burden that Ukrainian women face as they flee their country with their children often leaving their male relatives behind and uncertain of their destination. The majority of the now millions of refugees fleeing Ukraine are women and children, and what these women need is visa-free access to the United Kingdom with their children. We must match the European Union on this. No ifs and no buts, and so let's get on with it. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, women are particularly vulnerable in war, because of their sex. This is because women are particularly vulnerable to sexual violence at the hands of men. That violence is sex-based and directed at women because of our biology and the fact that we are weaker than men. Sex matters. I don't know why we call it gender-based violence, because it's not gender-based violence. It's sex-based violence. Gender is a social construct. Sex is a material reality. And I'd like to hear us talk more about sex. I'd like to hear us talk about the sex-based pay gap. I'd like to hear us talk about the fact that, as Professor Alice Sullivan has said so powerfully in The Guardian today, it is mothers and not fathers who bear the burden of parenthood. Research shows that men often get a pay premium as a result of parenthood, but women's pay goes down. And I would also like us to be able to say as is the case in law, that lesbians like myself are same-sex-attracted women, not same-gender-attracted. Because, Madam Deputy Speaker, when you cannot, what you cannot define, you cannot protect, and what you cannot name cannot be properly discussed and debated. And that's why the stealthy erasure of sex-based language from our statute book and public and private policy making should be resisted. And it's also why politicians and policy makers should be precise in their language and not conflate sex and gender. Last month, Scotland's Supreme Court reminded lawmakers that reference to, to the protected characteristic of sex in the Equality Act is a reference to a man or a woman for which purpose a woman is a female of any age. And the court said, and I quote, Provisions in favour of women based on the protected characteristic of sex by definition exclude those who are biologically male. That is the law. I am quoting from the case of Four Women Scotland against the Lord Advocate and the Scottish Ministers, and I am quoting from paragraph 36 of the judgment, the highest court in Scotland. So I defy anyone to say that what I have just said is transphobic. It isn't. It is the law. And it's based on the Equality Act, which also protects trans people from discrimination by the very widely drawn protected characteristic of gender reassignment. And the Equality Act was passed by the Labour Party. All credit to them for doing that. And I know the, honour the right honourable member for Camberwell and Peckham, who's not in her place, for who I have the highest regard, was very instrumental in passing that act. And the Equality Act is an act hugely valued by my party, the Scottish National Party, so much so that when our current First Minister was drafting the constitution for an independent Scotland in 2014, she decided to enshrine in that constitution the protections afforded to women and the other protected characteristics in the Equality Act. It was going to be part of the fundamental law of Scotland. I think it would be good if more Scottish politicians remembered that and celebrated it. I'd like to quote Suzanne Moore in an excellent column in today's Telegraph 
Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm not really in the habit of buying or reading the Telegraph, although a very dear friend of mine, a very dear friend of mine who's now dead, used to say that she bought the Telegraph every day so that she would have something reliable with which to disagree. <laughs> But there's a, very good, there's a very good column in it today by Suzanne Moore, and she says in that, words matter because women naming ourselves and our experience matters. And I quote again Suzanne Moore, as the American social reformer and women's rights activist Susan B. Anthony had it, no self-respecting woman should wish or work for the success of a political party that ignores her sex. And no self-respecting woman, in my view, should wish or work for the success of a political party who makes her rights as a woman or a lesbian conditional on her acceptance of gender identity politics. My rights as a woman and a lesbian are not conditional on my accepting gender identity politics. Yet, as a member of the advisory group of the organisation Sex Matters, and I make reference to my register of interests in that respect, I'm aware of many cases across the United Kingdom of women being harassed and investigated at work for expressing gender critical views. But now, thanks to the courage and resilience of a woman called Maya Forstatter and her legal team, we have an employment appeal tribunal ruling that gender critical beliefs are protected under the Equality Act. And that, Madam Deputy Speaker, was a major victory for freedom of belief and freedom of speech across these islands. Professor Joe Phoenix of the Open University and postgraduate student Raquel Rosaria Sanchez of Bristol University are just some of the brave women taking their universities to court for failure to defend them from harassment because of their gender critical views. And across the United Kingdom, many women and indeed men are now taking their employees and membership organisations like the Green Party of England and Wales to court for discriminating against them on the grounds of their beliefs that sex is real and immutable. So what I say to all the gender critical women watching this debate today is we are starting to win this debate and people like me won't give up no matter what's thrown in our road. Maya Forstatter's win is not the only significant one since last International Women's Day. I've already mentioned for Women's Scots win in Scotland's Supreme Court. Fair Play for Women had a major court victory on the meaning of sex in the census in England and Wales, although they were not so successful in Scotland. And my, yes, I will give way. Well, she's making a terrific speech. But would she agree with me that actually men have got to stand up for women's rights too? And there are too many men who stand back from this debate and say, oh, well, this is a women's issue. I'm not going to get involved. And I think that's a shame. And that's why I spoke in today's debate. I entirely agree with the Honourable Gentleman. And in fact, it's even worse. There are many men, young men, involved in this debate who have embraced a new form of misogyny. And I know that to my cost. And I would hope that that will start to change. But I'm trying to be positive, And I want to list, before I sit down, just a couple of the other successes that there have been in the last year for gender critical women such as myself. My friends at the LGB Alliance are registered as a charity now and they held a major conference attended by many parliamentarians and I see some of the parliamentarians who attended the conference here. Sadly, a straight married member of this house saw fit to protest outside the conference which was organised by lesbians to discuss the rights of same-sex attracted people. Madam Deputy Speaker, I thought I'd seen the last of that sort of lesbophobia in the 90s, but it turns out that I was wrong. And I repeat that lesbian rights are not conditional on our accepting gender identity theory. Another positive development has been the Equality and Human Rights Commission entering the debate on self-identification and how to frame the quite appropriate ban on conversion therapy. And they entered it with a voice of calm common sense, reminding us that human rights are universal and that all protected characteristics under the Equality Act deserve protection. And others have mentioned the very welcome interim report of the CAS review today, and I hope the Minister will be able to assure us that the Government will look very carefully at the interim report of the CAS review and look into this alarming phenomenon of so many young women feeling so uncomfortable with their identity as women and going through puberty and our society that they feel 
that they have to change their identity to cope with those pressures. I will, yes. Can, can I add two points to her and, and through her? The first is Suzanne Moore ought to be able to write her column for The Guardian. And I hope that The Guardian tomorrow will report the speech that the Honourable Lady is making in full and explain why Suzanne Moore can't publish her own thoughts in her own newspaper as it was. The second point, on the uh, LGB Alliance conference which I attended, I went up to some of the people protesting outside and had asked if they'd read the book Trans, whether they'd read the book Material Girls, they said no. I then invited them to join me in asking Liam Hackett, the chief executive of the anti-bullying charity Ditch the Label, if he would withdraw his words of describing Kathleen Stock as a dangerous extremist for giving her plain views on women's rights. Well, I agree with what he says, and I'm proud to call Professor Kathleen Stock a friend, and she's a very uh, admirable scholar, uh, a feminist and a lesbian, who's written very carefully about these issues and the way she's been introduced by students at her university and by some, I'm sad to say, some politicians in one of my favourite cities, which is Brighton, is absolutely um, disgraceful. But I, I wanted to be positive today, and, and I do think, you know, that, Madam Deputy Speaker, that the tide is turning on uh, this issue, and I think I'm living proof that cancellation doesn't always work. Um, so just before I sit down, I've got a couple of questions for the Minister. Um, will she back the Equality and Human Rights Commission to produce solid guidance on definitions of the protected characteristics and single-sex services? Because a lot of the harassment that I've described stems from women setting out the case for single-sex services and then facing wrongful accusations of transphobia. Secondly, will she push for government departments to end the use of external human resources benchmarking schemes for legal compliance with the Equality Act? Because, as we saw in the Akua Reindorf report at Essex University, some external benchmarks, I'm sad to say, some from Stonewall, who are, of whom I used to be a supporter but no longer am, have been wrong in uh, law. And finally, once the EHRC published some decent guidance, will she review civil service HR policies to make, they are sh to make sure they are in line with the law of the land under the Equality Act rather than in line with prejudiced lobbying groups. Thank you. Thank you. Laura Trott. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And it really is a pleasure to follow the uh, Honourable Member for Edinburgh South West. And I salute her courage yeah. in talking yeah. about these issues yeah. because they're not always easy, but they must be discussed. 